Thank you for your testimony. Um, for this hearing, we will forego the first round of questions uh, by committee counsel and immediately proceed to member questions under the five-minute rule. Um, I do want to respond to uh, the comments of my uh, ranking member, however, um, that I think suggested that this was a surprise to the minority. We informed the minority last night um, after our hearing that we would, because of the nature of the testimony today, we did not believe that a staff member round was necessary. Um, and the message we got back from the minority was, okay, got it, thanks for the heads up. Uh, so the minority was uh, on notice. It raised no objection about uh, going directly to member rounds. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, um, the minority has represented that we have not called any minority witnesses. Uh, that is not accurate. Um, Mr. Hale appears tonight as a minority witness. Uh, I know that's not how you characterize yourself, Mr. Hale, but your testimony was requested by the minority. Likewise, uh, two of the witnesses yesterday, uh, Ambassador Volker, uh, as well as Mr. Morrison were both minority requested witnesses. Now, Mr. Volker, Ambassador Volker testified that uh, he didn't believe any of the allegations against Joe Biden, uh, and in retrospect that he should have understood that an investigation into Burisma was really an investigation into Biden, uh, which he acknowledged would be inappropriate. Uh, and Mr. Morrison gave testimony as to uh, conversations that he had with Ambassador Sondman um, about the conversations that he had relayed to the Ukrainians about the hold and security assistance being a result of the failure to secure the investigation. So I can understand why the minority does not want to now characterize them as minority requested witnesses, but nonetheless, they were minority requested witnesses. I now recognize myself uh, for five minutes. And uh, I want to begin by asking you, uh, Ms. Cooper, about what you just uh, informed us of to make sure that I understand the import of what you're saying. As early as July 25th, uh, the same day President Trump spoke with President Zelensky on the phone and uh, asked for this favor, uh, the same day that President Zelensky thanked the United States for its military support and signaled it was ready to purchase more javelins, on that date, um, you got inquiries your staff got inquiries from someone at the Ukrainian embassy uh, who was concerned about the status of the military assistance. Is that correct? Sir, that's correct. I would say that specifically the Ukrainian embassy staff asked what is going on with Ukrainian security assistance. And did that uh, connote to you that they were concerned that something was in fact going on with it? Yes, sir. And you received... I guess your staff received more than one inquiry on that date. Uh, what was the other, the nature of the other inquiry on July 25th? Uh, sir, the, that was the one inquiry to my staff, but the other um, points that I had raised were uh, emails reflecting outreach to the State Department. So the Ukraine Embassy was also con contacting the State Department to find out about uh, its portion of military assistance? Yes, sir. And was that similarly uh, a concern about what's going on with our military aid? It was similarly a question about what, what's going on with security assistance. And your staff or one of the other department staff also heard in August uh, additional inquiries uh, from the Ukraine embassy about a potential holdup in the military assistance? Sir, I want to be careful about how I phrase this. Uh, my staff recall having had meetings with Ukrainian embassy representatives during the month of August, and they believe that the topic came up at some point during those meetings, but they don't recall the precise date or specifically what the, the nature of the discussion was. But your staff at least gleaned from those conversations that the Ukrainian embassy was aware that there was some kind of a hold uh, on the assistance. Sir, the way I would phrase it is that there was some kind of an issue. Yes. Um, you are now, Ms. Cooper, the third witness uh, before our committee who has testified that the Ukrainians found out about a problem or a hold on the security assistance prior to it becoming public, but you're the first to indicate that that may go back as early as the date of the President's call with President Zelensky. Uh, let me move to a related issue. 
In August, you testified at your deposition that you met with Kurt Volker, I believe it was on August 20th. The hold on security assistance was still in place. Uh, you testified that Ambassador Volker told you that if he could get Zelensky to make a public statement, quote, that would somehow disavow any interference in U.S. elections and would commit to the prosecution of any individuals involved in election interference, it might lift the hold on security assistance. Uh, is that correct? Sir, I believe that I uh, testified that it was my inference that that would uh, lift the hold on Ukraine security assistance. And that was your inference because at the time you were talking about the hold on security assistance? That's correct. The first part of our conversation was about the hold on security assistance. And it was during that portion of the conversation that he brought up the effort to um, get this public statement? It was during that conversation. I'm not sure I would say it's during that part of the conversation. What else did you discuss in the conversation? The only two topics that I recall are the urgency of lifting the, the hold on security assistance and then him relaying uh, this separate diplomatic effort um, that I had previously been unaware of. Uh, so you didn't have any discussion about any White House meeting? Sir, I don't recall specifically talking about the White House meeting, but we I've had many conversations about the desire for the White House meeting, um, so it's likely that that was a part of the conversation. But the two things you do recall are that you talked about the hold on security assistance and that he brought up this public statement that they wanted Zelensky to get that he thought um, uh, might be useful. That is correct, sir. Mr. Nunes. Yield the Mr. Ratcliffe. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Ambassador Hale, Ms. Cooper, thank you both for being here. Um, in his opening, Ranking Member Nunes uh, referenced President Trump's general skepticism of providing aid uh, and the amount of foreign aid being provided to foreign countries. Uh, would you agree with that characterization, Ambassador Hale? Um, we've often heard at the State Department that uh, the President of the United States wants to make sure that uh, foreign assistance is reviewed scrupulously to make sure that it's in, truly in U.S. national interests and that we evaluate it continuously so that it meets certain criteria that the President's established. And since his election, is it fair to say that President Trump has looked to overhaul how foreign aid is distributed? Uh, yes, the NSC launched a foreign assistance review process uh, sometime, I think it was late August or early September 2018. All right. And throughout both his campaign and his administration, President Trump has repeatedly sought to reframe, uh, reframe American foreign policy in economic terms and, as he described, America first. Uh, policy and consistent with that, well before there was a whistleblower talking about a pause on aid to the Ukraine, the president had expressed genuine concern about providing U.S. foreign assistance. Uh, to that point, is it fair to say that the president has wanted to ensure that American taxpayer money was being effectively and efficiently spent outside of the United States? Yes, that is the broad intent of the Foreign Assistance Review, among other goals. And has the President expressed that he expects our allies to give their fair share of foreign aid, as evidenced by a point that he raised during the July 25th phone call with President Zelensky to that effect? The principle of greater burden sharing by allies and other like-minded states is an important element of the Foreign Assistance Review. Is it fair to say that in the Trump administration, U.S. aid is withheld from foreign countries for a number of factors? Correct. And you've testified in your prior testimony that it is normal to have delays um, on aid. I may have said it that way, but it is certainly an occurrence. It does occur. In the past year, Ukraine was not the only country to have aid withheld uh, from it. Is that correct? Correct. In the past year, was aid held, withheld from Pakistan? Yes, sir. Why was aid withheld from Pakistan? Excuse me. Because of unhappiness over the uh, policies and uh, behavior of the Pakistani government toward certain proxy groups that were involved in conflicts with the United States. And in the past year, was aid also withheld from Honduras? Uh, aid was withheld from uh, the three uh, states in central, northern Central America, yes. In the past year, was aid withheld from Lebanon? Uh, yes, sir. And when aid was first held, withheld from, Ebana, uh, from Lebanon, um, were you given a reason why it was withheld? No. 
So having no explanation for why aid is being withheld is not uncommon. I would say it, it is not the normal way that we function. But does happen? It does happen. And is it true that uh, when aid was being withheld from Lebanon, that was at the same time aid was being withheld from Ukraine? Correct, sir. And uh, you've testified that the aid to Lebanon still hasn't been released, is that right? That is correct. All right. But the aid to Ukraine was released on September 11th, correct? Uh, I read that, yes. All right. So it's fair to say that aid has been withheld uh, from several countries across the globe for various reasons, and in some cases for reasons that are still unknown just in the past year. Correct, sir. So um, the assertion has been made that uh, President Trump's Ukraine policy changed uh, when there was a pause in uh, the, the aid or the aid was withheld. Um, is that an accurate statement? That was not the way I understood things to be happening at the time. We were not given an explanation. And in terms of our policy, in terms of aid to Ukraine, you've described it as very robust. Our aid to Ukraine? Yes. Yes. Um, as evidenced by President Trump's policy decision to provide lethal defensive weapons, Javelin missiles. It was very robust, yes, sir. Uh, and that was a decision that President Trump made that uh, President, the prior administration, President Obama, had not done. Lethal weapons had not been provided to Ukraine in the Obama administration, correct? I was not involved in Ukrainian affairs during the Obama administration, so I don't feel competent to address that. Uh, and when aid to Ukraine was put on pause, I believe you've testified that there may have been concern by Secretary uh, Kent and by Ambassador Taylor that it was contributing to a potentially negative effect on U.S.-Ukraine relations. Do you agree with that? Well, the State Department position was to advocate for the continuation of that assistance uh, as an important element, in fact, a key element of our strategy to support Russia, uh, support the Ukraine against Russia. My time's expired. I yield back. Mr. Himes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses for testifying uh, tonight. I'm delighted to follow Mr. Ratcliffe because he just perfectly summarized the defense that, that, that my Republican colleagues are mounting of this behavior. And the defense goes like this. The president is acting on some deep historical concern, apparently invisible concern, about corruption. And that because he's so concerned about corruption in Ukraine, he's holding up aid and being prudent and judicious. The first part of that is pretty easy to dispose of because President Trump wasn't worried about corruption in Ukraine. In fact, in the two conversations he had with the president of Ukraine on April 21st and July 25th, not once does the president of the United States use the word or mention corruption to the president. The second part of that is a little bit more interesting, that he's just being prudent and holding up aid. That's not just wrong, it's illegal. Because Ms. Cooper and I, I want you to help us walk through this. Since the Impoundment Control Act of 1974, the president has not had the authority to, on a whim or out of prudence, or as my Republicans say, because of a general skepticism of foreign aid, to stop foreign aid. Ms. Cooper, under our Constitution, it's the Congress, not the president, that controls the power of the purse, correct? Yes, sir. And the security assistance that was, the assistance that was authorized to Ukraine was authorized and appropriated by the Congress, correct? Yes, sir. So Congress is also concerned about corruption. It wants to ensure that American foreign assistance is spent wisely and does not worsen corruption. And so when Congress authorized this money, it built in conditions, just as Mr. Ratcliffe suggested. By law, Ukraine wouldn't get all the money until it demonstrated that it had undertaken substantial anti-corruption reforms. Ms. Cooper, under the law, the Department of Defense works with the State Department and other agencies to establish anti-corruption benchmarks and determine whether Ukraine has sufficiently met those benchmarks, correct? That's correct. That provision pertains to the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. And that's not, that's a legally specified process. That's not the president in the Oval Office manifesting a general skepticism of foreign aid, right? That's sir, a process. It is, it, is a, it is a congressionally mandated process, yes, sir. So did that process take place for the DOD funding that was held, held up in July? 
Sir, the process that took place for the certification took place prior to the May uh, certification to the U.S. Congress. So, right. Not only did it take place before, as required by law, but months before President Trump froze the money, the Department of Defense, in consultation with state, sent a letter to Congress certifying, and you, you, you said this in your opening statement, the government of Ukraine has taken substantial actions to make defense institutional reforms for the purposes of decreasing corruption, increasing accountability, and sustaining improvements of combat capability enabled by U.S. assistance. So by the time President Trump froze the aid, the Department of Defense had spent weeks, if not months, determining that the Ukrainian government met every requirement in the law and made significant strides in combating corruption. Is that correct? That is correct. We made that determination in May. So this wasn't about corruption. The timeline proves it. And in fact, if there was any doubt about what was going on here, the chairman referred to your inference from the conversation with uh, Ambassador Volker that if the Ukraine made a statement committing to the investigations, the aid would be lifted. You covered that with the chairman. And then, of course, we have the press conference of October 17th when Mick Mulvaney let the cat fully out of the bag. He revealed that President Trump talked to him about, and I quote Mick Mulvaney here, the corruption related to the DNC server and admitted that, quote, that's why we held up the money. Any other explanation for the hold is a farce. Now, in my remaining 30 seconds, just so that people understand what I referred to, in the 1970s, Richard Nixon just arbitrarily decided, I don't know if it was because he had a general skepticism of foreign aid or what his motives were, but Richard Nixon decided to hold up congressionally mandated aid. And as a result, Congress went to work and passed the Impoundment Control Act of 1974 which prohibits the president from withholding congressionally appropriated funds without the approval of Congress for any reason. Is that correct, Ms. Cooper? Sir, I am not a lawyer, but that approximates my understanding of the provision of the impoundment control. Okay, I'll go with that approximates. Thank you very much, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Conaway. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> As Paul Harvey said, this is the rest of the story, and my colleague failed to put the right emphasis on certain issues with respect to the certification. DOD certification was not your corruption writ large throughout the entire country of Ukraine. It was narrowly focused on defense institutional reforms and combat capability. Isn't that correct, Ms. Cooper? That's correct, sir. Uh, first off, Ms. Cooper, thank you for being here this afternoon. I, I appreciate that. But my colleague seemed to leave that out as original. He, he read it when you we read your statement, but he left off the corrective uh, emphasis. So the certification in May, didn't really speak to the broader concept of corruption throughout the rest of Ukraine that the president would be familiar with, or the rest of us would be familiar with. Sir, the May certification was specific to the defense sector, Thank you. defense industry, and it did reference the importance of civilian control of the military, relates, which relates more broadly to Right, but I, th I think all of us would argue, or none of us, I think, would argue that that fixes corruption throughout the rest of the country. Um, Mr. Cooper, maybe you can shed some light on the specific details. We talk about this you, the security assistance <clears throat> program, $250 million. Um, Some would argue that because of the pause, uh, that people died in August because of the pause. Can you help us understand exactly what obligated and was there things that were about to be delivered to Ukraine? Was Ukraine out of ammunition? Were they out of, uh, out of javelins? Were they out of all this stuff? And that because of this pause, they didn't get uh, certain... Uh, lethal equipment that uh, they needed in order to protect their folks during the month of August? Sir, we will deliver all of the equipment. I understand. I was trying to get a timeline. It, 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 there was no shortfall in equipment deliveries um, that were expected within that time frame. Obligate means that you're putting the funding on contract. Okay, um, and that's and contracts. You're starting be the process. Yeah, those full contracts will be full, fulfilled. Uh, fourth quarter, perhaps, or whatever so, it was? Sir, I have to say I'm a policy official. I am not a contracting expert. Um, but my understanding is that we will be able to make up for lost time sure. in the contracting process. Fantastic. You go through three or four steps as you went to because you disagreed with the hole being placed on the, uh, on the, on the uh, assistance. And uh, I certainly agree with that. But 
Uh, did you get any kind of criticism from the folks that you deal with because you were going against the OMB's direction to put a hold on that? Did you get criticized at all for that? Absolutely not. My uh, entire chain of command was supportive of advocating for uh, removing the hold on the funds. And you weren't restricted on full-throated advoca advocating on behalf of getting this uh, hold lifted, were you? No, sir. I faced no restrictions. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that. I uh, thought you might be more in, uh, in touch with the actual specifics of the accounting process, and so I will uh, I'll defer any further questions. And again, thank you for being here tonight. I yield back. Ms. Sewell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ambassador Hale, I, when did you actually find out about the hold on the Ukraine assistant? Was it July 21st? Yes, I, um, in the deposition that I did, the closed hearing, I misspoke. I was confused, and I confused June 21st, which was one, when State first sent the CN up to the congressional notification to OMB for clearance. It was only after about July 18, and I think the 21st is when I heard um, that there was a, a potential hold. Thank you for that clarification. Now, did you attend uh, the July 26 deputies meeting, uh, deputies committee meeting that occurred? Yes, I did. Was it also your understanding that the president directed the whole? Uh, we were told in that meeting by the OMB representative that they were objecting to proceeding with the assistance because the president had so directed uh, through the chief of staff, acting chief of staff. What was the State Department's position regarding the whole? State Department advocated, as I did in that meeting, for proceeding with all of the assistance uh, consistent with our policies and interests in Ukraine. You believed uh, what you said? You believed in the release of the whole? Yes, I did. Did anyone at the interagency meeting at the end of July support the whole? Did anybody want the whole to remain? And if so, who? What agency? The only agency, the only agency represented in the meeting that uh, indicated that they supported the hold was OMB. Ms. Cooper, did you understand um, similarly that there was an overwhelming interagency cons uh, consensus to lift the hold uh, and that OMB at the direction of the president was the only roadblock? Yes, ma'am. How is the security assistance in the national security interests of the United States? What is our interest? Explain that to my constituents in Alabama who are wondering why we should care about the security, the hold that's on the security assistance. Yes, ma'am. This specific assistance helps build the capacity of the Ukrainian armed forces. And it's important to understand that these are forces that are fighting to defend themselves against Russian aggression every day. It's an ongoing war. So they do need this equipment uh, to support their ability to defend themselves. And I would say there's a larger issue here that relates to U.S. policy on Russia. We believe it's very important to strengthen the capacity of Ukraine in order to deter Russian aggression elsewhere around the world. Exactly. Were you ever able to get a reason why that hold was on? Did you ever get a reason? No, ma'am. The only thing that I heard about it, but this is, again, you know, second, third hand, I'm, was that the president was concerned about corruption. But that was all I ever heard. So would you, um, were you ever provided any additional information about the reason for the hold? No, ma'am. I thank you, and I yield the balance of my time to the chairman. I thank the uh, gentlewoman. Uh, my colleagues in the minority asked uh, Mr. Hale, isn't it common to have holds on military aid? And I think you said they're not unusual. Would you agree, though, that it would be very unusual to place a hold on military aid in order to leverage a foreign country to get them to investigate a political opponent? Yes. And I take it you would agree that that would be completely inappropriate? That would be inconsistent with the conduct of our foreign policy in general. And it would also be wrong, wouldn't it? Certainly not what I would do. Um, Mr. Turner. Of course, it would be interesting if any witness had ever testified that that was the case. I yield my time to Mr. Jordan. I thank the gentleman for uh, yielding. First of all, I just wanted to go where the chairman started. He said that Ambassador Hale was one of our witnesses. They're all your witnesses. 
you, you, you called 17 witnesses. You subpoenaed 15 of them. Uh, they're all your witnesses. We didn't get a subpoena anyone. We didn't get to call anyone. You gave us an opportunity to get a list to you a couple weeks ago where we made suggestions on who you might allow us to have. So we did put three people of those 17 on that list so that they could provide at least some semblance of, of context and framework for this entire thing. So once again, try, misleading the, the folks watching this hearing is, is um, not, not helpful. Thank you both for being here and for your service to our country. Uh, Ambassador, I read through yours, uh, Ambassador to Pakistan, Lebanon, Special Envoy of the Middle East, Ambassador to Jordan, served in Tunisia, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. You've been about every hot spot on the planet. Thank you for uh, those hardship assignments. We, we, uh, we appreciate your, uh, your service. Let me go uh, first to uh, earlier this, today, Mr. Sondland, Ambassador Sondland, excuse me, uh, said that he was denied access to some of his records. And the State Department put out a statement. They said this, Ambassador Sondland, like every current Department of State employee called before Congress in this matter, retained at all times and continues to retain full access to his State Department documentary records and his State Department email account, which he has always been fully free to access and review at will. That's an accurate statement from the State Department, isn't it, Ambassador Hale? I had not seen it until shortly before entering this uh, hearing room, but it sounds accurate, yes. Uh, appreciate that. Um, Ambassador, you're aware of no connection between the pause and aid in exchange for any kind of investigation. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I missed a key word. Could you repeat the question? You're, you're, you're not aware of any connection between the pause in aid and an exchange for some kind of investigation being announced or done by Ukraine. Is that correct. right? And you're not aware of Secretary Pompeo having any knowledge, direct knowledge of a connection between investigations and security aid. Is that I'm correct? Not, I'm not aware of that. and He did not speak to me about that. You're not aware of any nefarious motive to withhold aid to Ukraine, is that correct? Correct, sir. In fact, you testified that what you knew was that President Trump was, one, skeptical of foreign assistance generally, Mr. Ratcliffe highlighted that in his round of questioning, and two, skeptical of the corruption environment in Ukraine. Is that accurate? Well, we had heard that. That was a general impression at the State Department, correct? And the aid was actually eventually released to Ukraine, is that correct as well? Uh, yes, I read that, sir. And there was just a 55-day or less than two months pause in the actual hold on the aid. Is that right, uh, Ambassador? Seems so, yes, correct. And to your knowledge, as a top principal at the State Department, an investigation into the Biden's Burisma of the 2016 election never happened by the Ukrainians. Is that correct? I don't know that I have the ability to answer that question, having taken this job in August of 2018. Oh. Well, since you've taken the job, how about that? To my knowledge, that's correct. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Carson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cooper, Ukraine is the first line of defense against Russia's aggression and expansion into Europe. Numerous witnesses testify that Ukraine is, in fact, vulnerable to Russian influence and control. At your deposition, sir, you testified that providing security assistance is, quote, vital to helping the Ukrainians be able to defend themselves, end quote. What do you mean by that, sir? That uh, we have a longstanding policy of uh, helping Ukraine become a, a resilient state in order to be able to defend itself. We want a reliable and resilient and self-reliant security and economic partner in Ukraine that can stand up to Russian intimidation and aggression. You testified at the time of Russia's 2014 attack that the Ukrainian armed forces were, quote, significantly less capable than it is today, end quote. Would you say, sir, that Ukrainian forces were outmatched by Russia's military in important ways? I, I did not so testify. I think uh, I, I'm Ambassador Hale, and of course, Ms. Cooper may wish Madam to Cooper, respond. would you like to comment? I'm sorry, I do believe that was my deposition, but could you just repeat the question briefly? So, uh, during the time of Russia's 2014 attack, the Ukrainian armed forces were, quote, significantly less capable than it is today. Uh, would you say that the Ukrainian forces were outmatched by Russia's military in critical ways? Absolutely. 
Uh, are the Ukrainian forces now completely self-sufficient in your mind, it, it, essentially in their ability to deter Russian aggression? No, sir. They, they have a long way to go. Uh, would you say that the Ukrainian armed forces now com are now completely self-sufficient, or how, how much of an impact do, does the U.S. need to have in terms of that deterrence, and how critical is the relationship between both Ukraine and the U.S.? Sir, the Ukrainians are on the right path to be able to uh, provide for their own security, but they will still need U.S. and allied support uh, for quite some time. And they need that support in the form of, you know, tangible uh, assistance um, as well as uh, political and diplomatic support. So this question is to the both of you. Uh, why was Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea so significant in your mind? Madam Cooper. Russia violated the sovereignty of Ukraine's territory. Russia illegally annexed territory that belonged to Ukraine. They also um, denied Ukraine access to its naval fleet at the time. And to this day, Russia is building uh, a capability on Crimea designed to expand Russian military uh, power projection far beyond the immediate region. In 2014, uh, were there concerns in Washington, here in Washington, and European capitals that Russia might not stop in Ukraine? I was not in my current position in 2014, but it is my understanding that there was significant fear about uh, where Russian aggression would stop. So what, what, what about today? If, if, if the U.S. were to withdraw its military support of Ukraine, what would effectively happen? It is my belief that if we were to withdraw our support, it would embolden Russia. It would also validate Russia's violation of international law. And which country stands to benefit the most, would stand to benefit the most from such a withdrawal? Russia. Ambassador Taylor uh, testified about the importance of the U.S. upholding uh, the international system. And uh, it has underwritten peace in Europe since the end of World War II. A critical aspect of defending that system is ensuring that Russia cannot change its borders by military force. That is why there is strong bipartisan support for providing Ukraine with security assistance. And that is why it is so incredibly destructive of the President of the United States to withhold this assistance as part of a scheme to pressure Ukraine into investigating a debunked conspiracy theory and attack former Vice President Biden. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Dr. Winstrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here. Uh, as Army Reserve Surgeon, I can say, as both of you had, that I served proudly for two Republicans and two Democrat uh, presidents myself. Um, I want to go to, um, part, Ms. Cooper, if I can, page three. He said, I heard the president had directed the Office of Management and Budget to hold funds because of his concerns about corruption in, in Ukraine. And, you know, you're coming from the DOD side here. You know, I served a year in Iraq, and it was important, and I think it's something that the Army always does, as I have seen, that we don't want to deliver aid or assistance if, there, if it's going to some corrupt or being delivered in some corrupt way. In other words, if we're going to build a medical treatment facility for the Iraqis, uh, we want to make sure we're not uh, getting charged 10 times as much. I mean, we, 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 we're concerned about corruption in general when we're delivering funds uh, through the DOD. Is that correct? We funds to Saudi yes, sir. Okay. So I think that, that that's a normal thing to, to want to be concerned about. And we would do that in, in Iraq, and uh, especially if, if we're providing payment f for something. So I just want to go through a few things with you, because multiple witnesses have testified that the action to provide javelins to Ukraine by the Trump administration dem demonstrated strong U.S. support to Ukraine. Ambassador Yovanovitch, in her deposition, said President Trump's decision to provide lethal weapons to Ukraine, that our policy actually got stronger over the last three years. She also said, in terms of lethal assistance, we all felt it was very significant with this that, th that this administration made the decision to provide lethal weapons to Ukraine. 
Ambassador Taylor said it was a substantial improvement in that this administration provided Javelin anti-tank weapons. Very strong political message, it said the Americans are willing to provide more than blankets. Ambassador Volker testified that providing lethal defensive arms to Ukraine has been extremely helpful. Mr. Volker also stated, MREs and blankets and all, that's fine, but if you're being attacked with mortars and artilleries and tanks, you need to be able to fight back. Secretary George Kent stated that javelins are incredibly effective weapons at stopping armed advance, and the Russians are scared of them. Special Advisor Catherine Croft stated, the javelins help Ukraine defend themselves. A decision to provide javelins, we believe, is counter to Russian interest. Do, do you dispute what these witnesses have testified to, in, including Ambassador Ivanovich, Taylor, Volker, and others? Sir, I absolutely agree that the Javelin system uh, is an important capability and that this was a very important decision to support Ukraine with this capability. Thank you. And you already testified that you're personally proud of the uh, Trump administration's decision to arm Ukraine with Javelins, correct? That is correct, sir. So one of the things on page three tonight, you, you were talking about a meeting July 26th, and after that you said, um, I was aware the national security community expressed unanimous support for resuming the funding as in the U.S. national security interests. That's correct? You said that tonight? That's correct, sir. So I guess I take a little question with resuming because we don't want to resume as is. Would that be correct? Because as is would not include javelins. Sir, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following. Well, what I was going to say, in the previous administration, javelins were not provided, even though they could have been. President Obama stopped the javelins. He could have delivered javelins, let's put it that way. Sir, I, I think I should clarify what I meant by that statement. Resuming was just referring to the fact that OMB had placed a hold on the assistance, so we weren't spending. Okay. And I wanted to resume the spending. Okay. Well, so that we could maintain this policy, okay. maintain the strength. Maintain the policy, but I guess what I'm asking, there is a difference, and I, th I think Under Secretary Hale, you might. I thought I saw you nodding. Um, the difference being that as it's resumed in this case, now it included javelins, which the Obama administration denied. Is that correct? It is true that um, the Trump administration uh, approved the release of uh, defensive lethal assistance to include Javelin, whereas the previous administration did not support that policy. Mr. Hale, do you have a comment on that? That seems correct. I defer to, to Ms. Cooper as the expert. Okay. Well, I think we can conclude that uh, more than blankets and MREs has been helping the Ukrainians. and. Uh, the lethal defensive weapons are something the Trump administration has approved, and it's a benefit to all of us. Thank you. Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both for being here this evening. You know, there's this mystery surrounding the hold on the aid in, in July, it appears. But back in May, Ms. Cooper, I, I believe you said that there was aid that was conditioned but you certified in May that the conditions had been met. And they include, included progress on command and control reform, commitment to pursue defense industry reform, and pass laws to enable government-to-government -government procurement. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's correct. So then when you find out in July that they're concerned about corruption, you're scratching your head, right? So yes, ma'am, we did not understand. And do you know of any effort that was undertaken then to assess the corruption in Ukraine in June, July, August? Ma'am, as I believe I said in my deposition, the only um, specific uh, discussions that I am aware of related to that series of interagency meetings, the sub-PCC as we called it, the PCC, uh, Policy Coordination Committee and the uh, Deputy Small Group. And in those meetings, participants did discuss the degree to which um, corruption was a concern and the degree to which there was progress. And 
my recollection of what the participants said in these meetings was that there was a very positive sense that um, progress was being made. So you have, have these meetings, progress is being made, nothing really changes from May until September that would then trigger the release of the money except a whistleblower came forward. Ma'am, I do not know what triggered the release of the funding. All right. Um, the fact that there was reference made to money being withheld in, uh, for other countries was made by some of our colleagues. But in those situations in countries like Pakistan, Lebanon, they're multi-year funding streams, correct? Ma'am, those accounts fall outside of my purview, so I cannot answer that question. Okay. Well, I've been told that that is indeed the case, so that there's not the, the immediate um, angst or hit financially that would potentially accrue. But the difference, as I see it, in Ukraine as compared to these other countries is that Ukraine is engaged in a hot war with Russia right now. And it seems that withholding that money was irresponsible, considering that they had made all of the, uh, taken steps to meet all the conditions that we had requested of them, and Congress had appropriated the funds. Is that not the case? Ma'am, I and my DOD colleagues advocated strenuously for the release of these funds because of their national security importance. So basically, the entire um, interests of the Department of Defense and State Department were consistently supportive of releasing these funds. Everyone was mystified as to why the funds had been withheld, and everyone's running around trying to get an answer, and you're getting kind of obtuse responses saying it was the president because of corruption. Now, what we see is that President Zelensky gets elected in April. Uh, the expectation is that Vice President Pence is going to uh, attend the inauguration in September, and then the president pulls the carpet out from under him in terms of him going. And then he proceeds in Ju June or July to withhold the funds. There is a, a concerted effort by the president of the United States to, to act in a manner that is not consistent with our interest in wanting to protect Ukraine and help them deal with the Russian aggression at its border. Would you agree with that? Ma'am, I have, you know, advocated for the security assistance and I have advocated for high-level engagement with the government of Ukraine because I think both are in the national security interest. That, I yield back. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Under Secretary, Sec Assistant Secretary, thank you both for being here. Um, you're both recognized as experts, dedicated public servants, and I got to tell you, being the President of the United States is perhaps the most complicated endeavor in the history of the world. No one could do it without people like you to provide that backbone that you do, and thank you for doing that. Um, I don't mean to repeat the same questions ad nauseum, but I think we reached a point of nauseam, I don't know, sometime yesterday or some time ago. It's some repetitive here, and you'll forgive me for doing that. Although, Ms. Cooper, I do have some, some questions based on some things you've said previously. And I just want to add, for clarification, there's a question about these emails that I think they claimed withholding, uh, described withholding the aid, and they had come from Capitol Hill or from someone on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Is that true? Sir, are you referring to my statement today or something previous? I believe this is previous, a uh, question we had previous. Are you aware of, of such um, an email? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I have enough information to make an assessment. Is it from a particular page in my deposition? Well, no, it's just reporting that we've heard that there may have been communications with you with someone on the Foreign Affairs Committee on the Hill. Is that, is that not true? That there may have been communications with me? Yes, email with you. S sir, I'm not, I'm not aware. Okay, thank you. Um, and for clarification as well, someone may have asked you or queried you from the U Ukrainian embassy about the withholding of aid. Is that true? Did you hear from them? 
Sir, I testified earlier that um, the communication from the Ukrainian embassy was to my staff, and my staff mentioned this to me after my deposition. Um, the only specific communication that I recollect with the Ukrainians about this specific issue was on, I believe it was September 5th, at a reception at the Ukrainian embassy. And just to bore down on that just a little bit, was that just a query generally about the forthcoming aid, or was it specific regarding it, them being aware that the aid was being withheld? Sir, so just to be clear, the September 5th conversation that I had was specific to uh, the hold. There, they, there was an awareness of okay. that, and there was a question of concern. Okay. Thank you. You know, Ms. Cooper, uh, well, to both of you, uh, Under Secretary Hill as well, uh, at the end of the day, it really does, and I've done this before, it really does come down to this. Uh, the transcript I'm holding up is a transcript of the phone call between President Zelensky and President Trump that uh, I would hope every American would take the opportunity to read. It's only a few pages long. And, uh, and much more information beyond that is maybe helpful to inform, but it really comes down to those conversations, those few sentences. But um, Mr. Hill, going quickly through a series of questions, and I have your answers here, so this won't take long, uh, and you've answered them generally anyway. You agree the United States should evaluate whether a country is worthy of our aid. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. And you understand as well that President Trump has been skeptical generally of foreign aid and, and some of the money that we've given. Is that fair as well? I think so. And I think that's been fairly consistent. He's done that since before he was elected, I think. Um, others in the process have testified the Ukraine has a long history of corruption. That's not going to surprise any one of us. We've talked about that about a thousand times. Do you think it was right that President Trump would test, is a word I think you used previously, that he would test President Zelensky prior to, uh, to providing some of the security assistance? The President Zelensky was new. Um, yes. I had met him in February. I was impressed by him. But I think it was understandable for the administration, as a new president in Ukraine was coming to office, to understand better what that president's policies would be and attitude toward the United States. And see, Under Secretary, I think that's key because we've had it referred to while the DOD had completed their review about the same time. But this was a person who was elected and we knew nothing about him. He didn't have a history of governance in Ukraine. He came really a, a little bit like President Trump himself. He did not come from a, a public background that we would have much information on him. And it seems prudent, to, as you said, to kind of test him and to see if he was serious about Ukraine. And at some point, I'm going to conclude, I believe it was about Labor Day, the Secretary was able to engage a president on the security assistance, about the same time, by the way, that uh, you had some others, uh, Secretary, Vice President Pence and Bolton's and, and Bolton as well, as well as the burden sharing review was completed, and shortly thereafter, the aid was released. Is that your understanding? Um, I, I was never informed as to why the assistance was released. I did read about it. Okay. Well, those events did happen, and it seemed like they were the reason the aid was released. But thank you both, and I yield back. Mr. Quigley. Thank you. Thank you both for being here, and thank you for your service. You've both been asked about uh, the importance of this uh, military assistance as it affects Ukrainian sovereignty and uh, its importance because of potential uh, greater ambitions by uh, the Russians. Let me try to put it in context and please get your reaction from, from both of you, from a, someone who had been there before, uh, a renowned international policy expert on such things, uh, Zygmunt Brzezinski. Uh, his quote seems to strike home today. He wrote, Russia can either be an empire or a democracy. But it cannot be both. Without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be an empire. But with Ukraine suborned and then subordinated, Russia automatically becomes an empire. Your thoughts of how this puts this into context today, please? Sir, I think that is a very powerful and accurate quote. I would agree. <clears throat> Ms. Cooper, you uh, talked about emails that were drawn to your attention, um, that you were, they were sent to your staff, is that correct? The emails that I discussed this evening were emails sent to my staff, that is correct. Okay. Uh, I, I think, first of all, it's important to point this out, that 
It's not something you are aware of, but it points to a larger issue that the Defense Department and the State Department have refused to comply with a, a duly issued subpoena to provide this committee with documents that would further shed light on when precisely the Ukrainians knew about the hold. So uh, this isn't something you're aware of, but there is untold information out there being blocked that would draw greater light and help us understand. Is there anything else out there that you're aware of or uh, possibilities that are out there with DOD or the State Department which could help us shed light on what the Ukrainians knew and when they knew it? Sir, I have shared with the committee all that I recollect, but I have not done an exhaustive investigation. So I really can't speculate on what else might be uh, available by combing through all of the Defense Department records, which are substantial. Did the State Department or the Department of Defense ask you for your information, or did, you, or did they coordinate with you to get information you had? Sir, uh, I was... Um, told not to, not to destroy anything, and our, um, our, our IT personnel uh, have been collecting documents, is my understanding. So um, that, that occurs without, um, without the individual having to. But they were collecting it and passing it on to state or DOD, is that correct? I'm sorry, sir, could you repeat they were, that? You said your department was collecting it. Well, they weren't passing that on to you, they were passing it on to, to the State Department? Sir, the Department I, of Defense? This is what they reported to me. I have not seen the documents that have been collected. I only know those documents um, that I have produced or that my staff has brought to my attention or that I have received. So, no, I do not know what has happened with the documents uh, that have been collected. Same general question to you, sir. I requested and, and was granted access to documents that I either originated or that had been sent to me that were relevant to the pertinent matters of this investigation during a finite time period. Um, I don't have really information about what else is going on in terms of other documents that, that, that I did not produce or that uh, I did not receive. Were I do you? know I, there was a, a move to gather them, and I understood generally, indirectly, and informally that they have been gathered. That's the extent of my knowledge. It's not my area of responsibility. Yes, but did they pass them on to you, or did they pass them on to the, the administration and somehow? The only documents I received, sir, were those within the parameters I described. What I requested, which was those and given, were the documents that either I produced or that were sent to me relevant to the matters we're discussing today. Thank you. I yield back to the chairman. 